Great. All right. Good afternoon. It is 4 o'clock on a Wednesday, and we have a lot to go over today. Uh, some exciting news, um, the guidance for healthy at school. Uh, we're going to uh, recap a big day uh, on economic development and rewriting the, the future of Kentucky's economy on Agritech. Uh, some announcements on steps on unemployment uh, that I know people have been waiting for. So a big day with a lot of information, but let's start the way we always start. Uh, by knowing and remembering that we're going to get through this, and we're going to get through it together. And we're going to get through this. We're going to get through this together. Uh, we're going to get through this together because we have shown that even with a worldwide health pandemic, if we can come together, unite, know what it takes, uh, then we can manage uh, even something as aggressive and deadly as COVID-19. So I want to start there today. Uh, with our update. Yesterday we had seen um, a, a larger number uh, and you know some of the national sites they just do you know by the day and, and I saw one map had us 50 percent up. Well it's because we had a hundred and something cases the day before and we are back down certainly below that 300 mark today. Where we are is is a plateau but a plateau is not the same number every day. It means we're going to go up and down within a range and as long as we can stay within that range, meaning uh, that we have enough bed capacity in our hospitals, enough ICU capacity, and enough ventilators, then we can continue to manage this virus while reopening. We are currently in a manageable phase with the plateau uh, that we're in. It doesn't mean that there aren't some things we can do better. We need a lot more people wearing masks. Uh, but remember, if you can stay, uh, that six feet apart, it is significant protection for you and for others. So today we're reporting 229 new cases of COVID-19. Again, in that range that we're seeing that has created uh, that plateau. Those cases uh, come um, 40 from Fayette County. They are seeing an increase. Uh, they're seeing um, a large part of that increase in their Hispanic community. I talked to Mayor Linda Gordon today. Uh, they are working with Blue Water uh, Diagnostics, which is a, a lab, uh, and, and setting up mobile testing units. Uh, it is innovative. It's going to be helpful. It's the type of leadership uh, that we greatly uh, appreciate. Jefferson County, uh, 32. Uh, Mayor Fisher there has also created uh, mobile units to make and, and arrange for, for walk-up. Uh, testing, uh, which, which again is a helpful way to, to help the population. 23 in Warren County, we continue to see that uh, as a hot spot. Uh, 20 in Christian County, 8 in Shelby, 7 in Kenton and Oldham, 6 in Boone and Laurel, 5 in Boyd and Nelson, 4 in Henderson, Perry and Simpson, 3 in Clark, Davis, Graves, Jackson, Madison, Mason, Barron, Breathitt, Campbell, Clay, Harden, Hart, Logan, Montgomery, Scott, Spencer, Allen, Anderson, Boyle, Butler, Elliott, Fleming, Grant, Greenup, Henry, Hopkins, Knott, Knox, McCracken, Metcalf, Morgan, Muhlenberg, Ohio, Pulaski, and Whitley all have one. It means even on a day where we're in the 200s or even the 100s, it's still everywhere. It can still spread everywhere. So don't take a, a low number just on a couple of days and say, well, our county doesn't have this. This is something that is everywhere and we have to deal with it as we reopen our economy. The moment we just decide that we're not going to follow any of the rules uh, is the moment that we see an outbreak. So let's continue to do the right thing. Let's continue to do this safely. Let's not be uh, the states that right now we are seeing huge, huge case numbers in. Uh, let's make sure here in Kentucky we continue to have a success story, at least as far as dealing with a deadly pandemic. Uh, total number of tests in Kentucky now, 368,152. Total number ever hospitalized, 2,574. Currently, 335. Ever in the ICU, 992. Currently, 79. That number is up a little bit, but still well uh, within uh, the range where we still have a significant number of our ICU beds. Current number recovered, 3,706. 
Importantly, tonight we still have almost 50% of our hospital beds uh, open and available. Uh, we have a significant number of ICU beds. We have plenty of uh, ventilator capacity uh, to, to deal with a uh, surge. If we saw one, a surge would take you know, several days to hit the peak. So um, while I do not want any cases of COVID-19 in Kentucky, if we can continue um, managing this, if we can get back to wearing masks a little bit more, if we can make sure we spread out. And remember, on Monday, just about everything's open on some capacity. I think everything's open in some capacity, which is more opportunity for more contacts. Make sure you've changed your lifestyle until we get a vaccine to have about 50% of the normal contacts that you would. So pick and choose what you do on a given day. Uh, I wouldn't um, uh, go to the, the barber, a restaurant, um, uh, the grocery store, uh, a bar, and everything, the gym, all in one day. You know, if, if, if you go to those places, sure, keep doing it, but just space them out and do about 50% that you'd normally do. We don't get to live normal lives right now. We get to live in our new normal where we manage uh, this virus. Uh, yesterday uh, was a tough day in that we lost 11 individuals. Now, part of that is waiting uh, for individuals that, that local health departments already know for it to be reported uh, to us and confirmed. Um, that's tough. We don't want days with 11. Uh, today, uh, we're only reporting one new death uh, here in the Commonwealth that is COVID related. That brings us up to a total death count of 538. Four of those are probable, the rest are lab confirmed. Today's is an 89 year old man from Laurel County. Um, and you know, it sounds when we say only one death like a, like a good day, but it's not a good day for that family. So let's, let's remember that. Let's continue uh, to light our homes up. Green <laughs> compassion's needed more in this world than ever. Uh, on so many different reasons and, and let's make sure that we keep showing it as Kentuckians and, and, and going forward, you know, regardless of what we're facing, whether it's COVID or not, I hope that we've learned that when we show compassion, when we talk to each other uh, without uh, the initial judgment or anger, when we uh, can put other people and their well-being ahead of ourselves, that's a special place to be and I think Kentucky is that special place uh, where we can be a better people and a better commonwealth uh, as we move forward. Uh, our total uh, case count as we're here after removing duplicates and the rest is now 14,363. Uh, breakdown of ethnicity and race on total number of cases, 82.97% uh, non-Hispanic and 17%, 17.03% Hispanic. Um, on race, 73.69% white, 14.74% black, 6.39% multiracial, 4.42% Asian, uh, under 1% in every other category. On the deaths, um, about 96% non-Hispanic and 4% Hispanic. Uh, and then on racial breakdown, 80% white, about 16 and a quarter percent black, 1.78% multiracial, 1.58% Asian. Again, this virus is not hitting every part of our population the same or in relation to the population. Uh, systematic uh, racism and racism within our healthcare system, inequalities is deadly. We have seen it in COVID. We all ought to work to end it and to make sure that not just for the next pandemic, uh, but, but you know, for, for, for whatever happens next, that we fixed it, um, not just in my lifetime, but in the very short term. Uh, we have that obligation and I think we have that opportunity. Uh, Long-term care, uh, updating the numbers, and this is since Monday, our last live update. 31 new residents, 17 new staff have tested positive and six new deaths attributable to long-term care, five new facilities. Uh, these numbers are, are big, but we see them uh, in every other part of the country too. Uh, what our numbers are not doing is growing at the rate that I believe that we see in other um, states and we're testing. We are testing in this area uh, more than just about everybody. It makes up a large portion of our testing and our numbers still are where they are. So while this is growing, it is becoming more stable. 
the response by the facilities is getting uh, better as we learn more, uh, and, and there's certainly a lot of work being done by CHFS uh, to ensure uh, that we are, are trying to provide uh, the best care that's out there. I want to ask Dr. Stack to come up uh, for a minute. We are seeing some concerning uh, outbreaks uh, that are being caused by areas where people are traveling to right now. Myrtle Beach is one area that we are seeing causing outbreaks uh, in other states and in Kentucky. We need people to be really careful. You know, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut just announced that uh, if you travel to a state that has a certain threshold of positives, that's everywhere it's growing, that, that you'd have to quarantine when you come back. We're not there, but we're asking people, if you know that there's a place that we can tell you that there are a lot of outbreaks, don't go. All right, Dr. Stack. Thank you, Governor Bashir. Uh, so I'd like to just remind folks that as we look forward to the summer and as we look to June 29th and we move to phase three in Kentucky uh, for reopening more activities, it's absolutely imperative that you follow the guidelines we've administered or that we've recommended. Because if we don't, we have circumstances like what I'm about to describe, uh, and this represents a serious threat to our health and wellness. So uh, we've identified a number of clusters tied directly to travel to Myrtle Beach over the last few weeks, actually dating back into May. So Myrtle Beach, just to give a summary, a very popular uh, summer uh, destination for many folks, opened their hotels May 15th, opened attractions May 22nd, a week later. About a week after that, they started seeing case numbers increase in, Harry, in Horry County, which is where Myrtle Beach is located. On June 11th, the mayor of Myrtle Beach declared a state of emergency. So it just took less than four weeks before they went from reopening to declaring a state of emergency. On June 17th, West Virginia issued a health alert because they had a cluster of positive COVID patients from Myrtle Beach. The next day, they identified a second cluster of people who had returned from Myrtle Beach. On June 11th, we had 12 Kentuckians travel to Myrtle Beach. They returned three days later on June 14th. At least nine of those 12 people who traveled to Myrtle Beach, that's 75% for the math, have come back positive for COVID-19, and they had symptoms starting as soon as four days after their return from that trip for the earliest. We now believe we have a second cluster that's tied to Myrtle Beach, and we have a third individual who went there who has also come back positive for the test, or for COVID-19. So. We have now identified both in West Virginia and here in Kentucky numerous people who have returned from Myrtle Beach uh, with COVID-19. I have to continue to urge and beg folks, um, be careful. It's not time to be cavalier because I just described a scenario where a place that was just starting a reopening process went from being fined to a state of emergency in three weeks. So the fastest way we can create a problem for ourselves is to ignore guidance like wearing masks, which is a relatively easy thing to do maintaining social distancing and having proper hand hygiene. Thanks, Governor. Now, in addition to wearing a mask, uh, the other thing that we need people to continue to do is be tested. That's how we know uh, that there is an outbreak at Myrtle Beach that puts people at risk right now if they are, are going there. So our new testing sites for next week, we're gonna continue in Louisville and in Lexington. Uh, we're adding a site in Kenton County again. We are actually seeing some disturbing numbers uh, in the Cincinnati area. It's a significant issue in Ohio. Uh, and we're seeing um, in some areas almost a 50% increase in northern Kentucky. So we think this one is very important. And our last site for next week is going to be in Pikeville. We need to make sure we get people to these sites. So we're going to talk, for instance, about uh, school reopenings. Uh, superintendents, please encourage uh, your school employees because uh, knowing whether you have COVID before walking into a classroom uh, or a building where it could be spread is, is really important. Um, any of the government offices, uh, since we've recently done reopenings there, make sure you get your people out and get tested. Uh, anybody out there that's never had a test, get one. If you've been out in crowds, if you've um, been getting together with groups of 10 or looking to, to get together with groups of 50 uh, starting on Monday, get a test. Uh, the only way that we reopen safely is if we continue to test and people work with our contact tracers. So let's make sure that we uh, do that. 
All right, today we're going to have a couple of pieces uh, of good news. Uh, one is that uh, late yesterday we were able to fully and finalize a settlement that is going to provide $383 million to our rural hospitals. And health care is a basic human right, and rural hospitals have been um, having significant difficulty long before COVID-19 in our current health care system. The expansion of Medicaid in Kentucky has kept many of them open, uh, while other states have seen them shuttered, but it hasn't eliminated uh, the true hardships that are there. Uh, this is about a, a lawsuit that goes back 13 years. And when I came into office, uh, the Bevin administration had left a budget that said we were going to have to pay $425 million of state funds over three years. We were able to settle it with the state's liability being only $93.9 million, with the rest of that settlement coming from the federal government. We're going to be able to do it all over a matter of months, providing much needed dollars uh, to our health care system at a time when it is needed most. And while these, uh, the print is small, it's because it's that many rural hospitals that are getting the help. I mean, if you look over here, uh, Harrison Memorial Hospital, first hospital that had to deal uh, and try to help uh, COVID patients, uh, $2.261 million. Uh, King's Daughter, a uh, group that we've been working very closely in in Ashland with a hospital closing there and this one trying to come in and, and provide all the services the community needs, $19.65 million. Uh, Murray Calloway, which has been doing some COVID testing in that area, uh, $4 million. So this is going to provide much needed cash. It's going to provide it soon to these hospital systems. It also removes a liability from the state books that overall, uh, at least the last administration, thought we'd owe a lot more for. This is a really good outcome for our hospitals. It's also a really good outcome from the state. And, and I want to thank Senator McConnell, uh, who helped convince the, the CMS national Medicaid uh, to chip in and do their part. This was truly a joint effort on behalf of our office and theirs. Uh, we had successfully negotiated with uh, the Kentucky companies, but we had needed to prompt action from CMS, and Senator McConnell's office uh, worked hard on that. This is good news for uh, a bunch of institutions that have been working really hard uh, within uh, during this, this pandemic. Um, Next, we're going to uh, unveil the Healthy at Schools plan. I know people have been waiting on this for a long time, uh, and it's going to be announced today by um, our Commissioner of Public Education and our Lieutenant Governor, who's also our Secretary for the Education and Workforce Cabinet. Uh, we're going to provide real guidance, real guidance on how to do this safely. And you know, there are going to be some who react either in the short or the long term in different ways. But what we cannot do, what would be irresponsible from the state, is to not make recommendations that we know will help protect not just students, but think about the teachers, the bus drivers, and the rest. And we've already lost some of those. It is critical that the reopening plan isn't just about the kids. It's important to get them back in the classroom, but they're pretty resilient to COVID. But all the adults that are in that building or get them to that building deserve to be safe too. Uh, so uh, I think we're going to start with Commissioner Brown. I got to tell you, um, Kevin has been doing a great job. When he took over the interim commissioner, he did not know it was going to be during COVID uh, and some of the most challenging times for our school systems. But he has been a, a, a great partner, a, a great guiding voice uh, to our educators, and we appreciate him. Commissioner. Thank you, Governor, uh, Lieutenant Governor, Dr. Stack, uh, and your team uh, for your cooperation and expertise uh, over the uh, past few weeks and months uh, to ensure that we have expectations on how we can not only reopen our schools, but strategies and expectations to ensure that our schools can stay open. Later, the Lieutenant Governor uh, will be addressing some, uh, some good news, some flexibility that uh, she and the Governor are able to afford districts using the Governor's original emergency order issued in March. 
and that's uh, related to uh, school funding and attendance flexibility. If you can advance the slide, please. I've been waiting to be able to say that here. That's on my bucket list. Um, and I'm going to, uh, the Lieutenant Governor will explain the details of this, but this is uh, a way that we are uh, able to be flexible at the state level. And it's going to enable us to continue using non-traditional instruction in the 2020-2021 school year. And then it's also going to ensure continuity and predictability in education funding for that same school year. If you can advance the next slide, please. The last time I was here uh, with you, Governor, uh, you sent me on my way and uh, with the expectation that we would continue learning uh, even though we were not going to be in in-person classes. And that was a very huge lift on the part of our schools and districts. And I'm pleased to say that we did that. Uh, we being the entire uh, Commonwealth, but our school community, our teachers, our families, uh, but most importantly our students and their parents helping them with those assignments at home. Uh, on March 28th, the Wall Street Journal had a headline that talked about some other districts and schools around the country that were discontinuing remote instruction during that same time period because in the, the quote said it was too tough. It wasn't too tough for Kentucky. It was hard, but we did it. Uh, there, there were imperfections in the non-traditional instruction program, but from March to May, it was a heroic effort in the Commonwealth on the part of teachers, administrators, staff, and those students and families working at home to complete the 1,062 hours of instruction and at the same time our schools and districts and their partners in their communities serve millions of meals at over 2,000 sites. So now we're pivoting to reopening. And if you can advance to the next, the, if you actually go back, I'm sorry. Uh, these are the documents listed that we have issued at the Department of Education in cooperation with other state agencies such as the Department of Public Health and others to help guide districts. That initial document was issued on May 15th. It provided the initial guidance that districts needed to have conversations with their community about how they could reopen and the needs of that community. In Kentucky, we honor local control. We honor the flexibility that districts want and that they have to make the decisions that are best for their communities. I'm not going to read the other um, documents that we issued other than I want Kentucky to know that those documents are there and uh, they go into great detail uh, in such areas as stu uh, teaching and learning during a pandemic and addressing learning loss when our students come back. But now we're to June 24th and you'll see that the, in bold there, that is what I'm uh, referring to as our flagship document. Uh, that is the document that uh, in cooperation with public health and other state agencies that we are releasing today that uh, identifies the safety expectations and best practice guidelines uh, for Kentucky schools. It's, I call it the flagship document because the documents listed there and then the future documents that we will issue at KDE will rely on the guidance in this document. This is a public health crisis and this is the major public health document. Uh, with the expectations and best practices that our schools need in order to operate and reduce the risk of uh, the spread of COVID-19. I can't say enough about the partnership uh, between Department of Public Health, Education and Workforce Development, uh, Cabinet, of course the Governor and Lieutenant Governor, their staff, and then KY Stats. In this document when you see it, uh, you're going to see a lot of graphics. It's easy to understand for school districts. It's also a document that will be easy to understand by parents and communities, and that's key. KY Stats and, and their creative team over there, they're, they're responsible for putting the document in that type of format. That type of format was based on feedback that we received from school districts several weeks ago. And is that, that's a perfect example of how that document has changed over the last few weeks based on that feedback we're getting from our education partners. Next slide, please. As I indicated, the guidance is divided into safety expectations and best practices. So expectations being things that districts and schools must do to reduce the risk of COVID-19 in order to operate. Of course, best practices are those things we would love to see them do. The, they will not be required to do, uh, but we hope that they do so if they are able to do so, do so using their uh, resources. 
And, you, and we ask why are we issuing this document? Why is it divided into expectations and best practices? It's obviously so we can reopen. Most importantly, it's so we can stay open. And we need to make sure that we are keeping our students, staff, staff and community safe and reducing the risk of the spread of COVID-19. I'm going to briefly go over the five areas that are listed there, those five areas with the five bullet points. That is how this document is divided. And so um, in, uh, since March, we've been having weekly superintendent webcasts. Those webcasts are widely available. You can watch those online. I think the one we had yesterday, we had over 500 individuals uh, logging into that webcast. We don't have 500 superintendents. We have 172. And uh, my point is most of the information in this uh, reopening document, it is not new information. These are things we've talked about. You've heard the governor talk about, the lieutenant governor, Dr. Stack. And I'm going to briefly go over them. Under social distancing, there will be a, a six feet social distancing requirement uh, in our classrooms. However, and due to the work and the cooperation of public health, there are there some uh, lenience, there's some leniency there and some exceptions. If districts are unable to have that six feet distancing in a classroom, and when you start adding that up, uh, that adds up quickly and it gr greatly reduces the capacity of a classroom. Uh, students will be able to be seated closer together, uh, but masks will be required. So if you're seated closer than six feet, you've got to have a mask on during your instruction. If you're in a classroom and you have that six feet social distancing around your desk, your mask can come down while you're seated. However, and as one of our superintendents said, uh, a good thing to remember in our schools and in, in just in our society in general, that when you move, you mask. That's going to be the same rule in our schools. Uh, this is going to result in cases of sm uh, recommended smaller class sizes. Uh, obviously, spacing students out in hallways, districts will be asked to put tape every six feet, just like you are seeing now in our shops and restaurants. And also, of course, limited assemblies, and any type of assembly must follow, of course, the governor's recommendations on public gatherings. The next issue are uh, the issue of uh, personal protective equipment and masks. This may be, uh, unfortunately, one of the most controversial uh, items, that, and you're certainly hearing a lot of discussion about that out on social media and in our society. Uh, again, if, you are, if a student is moving, they need to have a mask on. If they are less than six feet, they need to have a mask on. When they are on a bus, they need to have a mask on. Another example of how our public health, really listening to some of the concerns of our school districts about getting on a school bus. Uh, we obviously know in Kentucky, uh, we don't have um, extra education funding or any funding for that matter. And uh, we really need to be cautious on how we spend that. And so districts were concerned about the uh, having to maybe run additional bus routes. And so we are going to be able to fully load our buses so long as certain conditions are met. One of those will be wearing a mask. One of those will either be a temperature check upon entry to the bus or a parental assurance to the school district that the child, when presented to uh, get on the school bus, does not have a temperature of over 100.4. However, when those students arrive at school, all students will need to be screened for a temperature check. Screening. Uh, you've heard Dr. Stack talk a, uh, about this before, and the document will go into the various screening requirements um, and um, items that will indicate when a student needs to stay home or be sent home. And those, of course, are a temperature of greater than 100.4 and or a cough and or vomiting or diarrhea and or a new rash and or exposure to uh, a COVID-19 case within 48 hours. Sanitation and environment factors, those are uh, self-explanatory guidance on how school districts need to clean the schools, clean buses. Signage, uh, we've working with, uh, been working with KY Stats uh, and Governor has an example of a poster that we will be sending to our school districts. KY Stats did a great job. We will be uh, including those in all of our school buildings. We'll also be, be doing another poster that is more age appropriate for our high school students. And then finally, contact tracing. Districts will be cooperating with their local health departments uh, in case there is a, a COVID-19 case in that school, the local health departments and contact tracers will need to look at bus manifests, will need to determine where Kevin was sitting on the bus, 
what is the seating chart in a classroom to determine uh, whether or not uh, I inadvertently expose someone in the cafeteria or in the classroom or on the bus. And you may ask, um, uh, how are we going to do this? And it seems like a huge lift, and it is a huge lift. We're going to do it the same way we did it um, last semester. And um, I believe that we have the best teachers, <clears throat> administrators, and staff in the country. I know this because I'm a Kentuckian, and all of us Kentuckians, we of course are biased about Kentucky, but I also have facts on my side. And uh, seeing what I saw in our school districts, uh, all 172 of them, what they did last semester, even though it was imperfect and even though non-traditional instruction is imperfect, what they did and how they did it tells me that they will be doing this and they will be meeting this, these expectations because they know that's the best thing for their students. I have a great example of a video here uh, that is an example of what we want our education or educational partners to do. And one of our education uh, partners is the Kentucky Education Development Corporation. They are an education cooperative. And uh, without prompting from me, uh, a few hours ago I received this video from their executive director. And uh, we need to see this type of video from other media outlets and other organizations across the state. If you could please play the video. This is a mass campaign from the Kentucky Education Development Corporation. And I challenge all other cooperatives, other partner organizations, the media, famous Kentuckians, athletes, we need your help. Uh, we need to be modeling uh, this. We need to be modeling social distancing, healthy at home, healthy at work, model wearing face coverings and, face coverings and masks. Thank you, KEDC, for that. And I'm looking forward to seeing all the other creative ways that we're going to get this message across Kentucky. If you could advance to the next slide, please. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier we do have additional KDE guidance. Upon release of the document today, we're not just going to say good luck, uh, schools and districts, you're on your own. Uh, this is just part of the process. This document will become uh, the flagship document as I referenced. However, we will be uh, adding additional guidance from the department in consultation with all the other state agency partners on pupil transportation, workplace health and safety, and facilities and logistics, and then career and technical education. So when you see the document that's released today, you may see only a half a page uh, dedicated to sanitation on a school bus, for example. That doesn't mean that's the only guidance we're giving school, schools on how to sanitize a bus. Those are the expectations from public health at a very high level. And then you, you're going to see that we're going to layer in this uh, pupil transportation guidance document tomorrow that will be right in line with the document we issue today, but it will go into much more detail on how schools and districts need to address pupil transportation, sanitation. Uh, if if uh, districts were to have a, a monitor on the bus and the monitor was able to uh, take temperatures as students arrive on the bus, which was, is a, certainly a best practice instead of waiting till school, how that would occur. So uh, we're going to continue to be providing that guidance. Uh, we're going to continue our education continuation task force. The lieutenant governor is a member. We have over 40 members from the education community on that task force, including four members of the General Assembly. And I've made a decision to continue all uh, education advisory groups that the commissioner has uh, to advise me and then the new commissioner that's coming on throughout the rest of the summer. Normally we take the summers off and we're going to also uh, bring our student advisory group back. 
Um, they, have seven, they will have 17 new members and we hope to bring them back virtually in July. We really want to hear from our students. We had three student advisory um, meetings and I have to say they are a tougher group than the superintendents. And, uh, and both offered excellent feedback as we've dealt with this pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. Again, I want to reemphasize and to everyone listening, why is this important? Why is it important we have these expectations? Why is it important that your child wear a mask at school? It's important because we need to protect teachers like John Page. Unfortunately, uh, last week we lost John Page. Uh, he was a 47-year-old welding instructor at the Monroe County Area Technology Center and he uh, passed away due to uh, complications from COVID-19. We're sharing this with you today with the permission of his family. Our welding instructors, our students, our teachers, our staff, they deserve to work and learn in an environment with reduced risk of a disease without a vaccine and without a treatment. And that's why the document that we're releasing today is so important. And that's why I know that our districts and our teachers are going to act in good faith to reopen our schools with these expectations. Next slide, please. I want to leave you with this. Um, necessary does not always equal easy. The expectations that we're providing today for our schools and how to reopen them safely and reduce the risk, they, it is not easy. Those recommendations are not easy to implement. They will not be. Uh, but they are certainly necessary. We only have three major ways to mitigate the risk of COVID-19, wearing a mask, spreading out, and washing hands. Washing hands is generally accepted in our society, and I think our school districts will get support from our communities if they enforce washing hands in our schools. Unfortunately, um, wearing a mask has become a divisive issue in our Commonwealth and in our country. And so we're going to need everybody in all of our communities to help our schools out, uh, knowing that this is an expectation that, we need, that needs to happen. As the commissioner, I'm ultimately responsible to ensure the health and safety of Kentucky students. And we need to come together as Kentuckians to make those sacrifices, such as wearing a mask and being a little bit further apart from one another. My grandfather was a prisoner of war in World War II, and growing up I learned the sacrifices of that generation. My other grandfather told me stories of the sacrifices made back on the home front due to the rationing of supplies and gas and tires and automobiles. Much greater sacrifices than um, wearing this cloth mask with the elastic. But here we are today as the children, the grandchildren, and the great-grandchildren of that generation, and we're seeing on social media that somehow is a problem or, or is controversial. Controversial. So as the commissioner uh, charged, at least for a temporary time until I turn this over, um, please celebrate the unity and the pride of being Kentuckians and join with me and our districts over the next months to model the behavior that we need to see in our schools with our children and wear a mask and practice safe at home, healthy at home. This is going to keep our schools open and it's going to reduce the risk and it is a small sacrifice for our generation. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Brown. I want to echo um, Governor Bashir's sentiments about what a wonderful job you've done in really, really difficult times. So thank you for your leadership. Um, many of you know I'm a former teacher. I spent my life in the classroom on the basketball court and as an assistant principal. And so I know the challenges that these uh, schools are going to face as they reopen. And as many people watch today, their parents, students, educators themselves, they're probably thinking, how in the world can we make this work? And the answer is simple. You cannot continue to do things that you used to do and expect to get different results. And so it is because of that that we have the support of the governor, the commissioner of education, and myself as a secretary of education and workforce development, that we are willing to also allow flexibilities to our school districts that will support them in uh, being able to implement these safety expectations for our students. It is not fair 
to just put new expectations on hundreds and thousands of children that come to the same school building every day without also allowing for our schools to be able to innovate um, and to be able to change the way they do things in the name of health and safety. And so um, I, wanna, I wanna make sure that we remember as we move forward, this is certainly about keeping our students safe, certainly about keeping our children safe. Uh, and many would say, well, COVID-19 doesn't cause death in children as often as it does adults. And that's true. But we also have to remember that we have folks that show up every day to make sure that school is clean when your child walks in. We have folks that show up to school every day to make sure that your child gets breakfast and lunch. We have folks that show up every day and will, and will interact with more people more closely as classroom teachers than probably anyone else in the community because they value their job, they value education, and they're there to support our children. So this is not just about one group of people. This is truly about our community and making sure that everyone is safe. And this virus does have a face. Uh, the governor stands here every day and talks to us as Kentuckians about how many people have contracted the virus and how many lives it's taken from us. And it's certainly taken the lives of folks who work in our school systems. In April, we lost a Fayette County school bus driver, Eugenia Weathers, who was only 56 years old. And another 16 employees uh, that she directly worked with also tested positive and were at risk. Grant County Schools lost Garolyn Stone and Joanne Banks to the virus as well. So it is our duty to protect every child, but it is also our duty to protect every adult and every family member of the folks in those school buildings. So together, the governor and the commissioner and I have come together to help uh, provide the flexibility that is needed by schools to meet these unique uh, circumstances. Today, as the Secretary of Education and Workforce Development, I approved a memorandum that was issued by the Commissioner of Education that temporarily suspends a couple of statutes. First, we're temporarily suspending the 10-day limit on NTI days so that the Kentucky Board of Education may grant the authority for an unlimited number of NTI days for the 2021 school year. This provides the flexibility to school districts to use NTI as needed for the next school year in the event that they need to close in-person classes as a result of COVID-19 spikes within their own communities. Secondly, we will temporarily suspend a statute that requires average daily attendance be utilized in calculating state funding to school districts for the 2021 school year so that the Kentucky Board of Education may set forth a funding mechanism similar to what we saw this past session with Senate Bill 177. This provides flexibility to school districts to receive funding in the event that schools need to operate a blended in-person and digital instruction in response to COVID-19. This memorandum addresses the concerns of school districts throughout the state who are planning a variety of instructional methods to best serve the needs of our students and the communities amid the uncertainty we face with COVID-19. Our school districts are developing models that work best for their unique communities, and this memorandum provides the flexibility they requested and they need. Next, I want to make sure that every uh, school district knows that we are pleased to announce the opportunity for our schools to participate in the expanded care program. Expanded care allows schools to bill for services provided to Medicaid eligible children who fall outside of the IEP or Individualized Education Plan. Allowing schools to provide services to 75% more children than before. This includes a three to one match by the federal government. So for every dollar that a school system puts in, the federal government kicks in another three. And the best news is the services that will be provided through this expanded care program are school nurses, audiologists, occupational therapists, speech therapists, physical therapists, interpreters, and uh, one that I know we are all um, desperately uh, in need of in our public schools, and that is mental health professionals. In addition, I would also like to announce that today, under the leadership of Governor Bashir, Kentucky continues to lead the way in our response to the COVID-19 pandemic. As such, I am sending a letter to the secretaries of education across the nation 
asking them to join Kentucky and calling upon our national leaders, Congress, Education Secretary Betsy DeVos, and the President, echoing Governor Bashir's request for an additional round of CARES funding for our state budget. Additionally, because education is a large part of state budgets, I have asked them to join me in requesting the funding necessary to safely reopen schools this fall. The way schools have been funded in the past must evolve with these new educational practices and expectations. Our educators, students, and their families have all adapted to these changing times. Our education funding must too. Reopening schools amid COVID-19 is going to be a very heavy lift for every school in this nation. Our ability to serve the whole child while protecting their health and safety will determine our country's economic resilience on the other side of this pandemic. Now more than ever, it is imperative that we speak with one unified voice on behalf of our students, faculties, staffs, schools, and communities by advocating for the funding and flexibility to provide the necessary protections and deliver essential educational services to our youngest citizens. And to close, I would simply like to say a special thank you to the Jefferson County Public Schools Language Services. With their help, we are going to be able to translate uh, the Healthy at Schools document into the top five languages that are spoken in Kentucky um, in our schools, which will help us to be able to communicate with every family in every community. So thank you. All right, a couple other quick announcements before we open it up to questions, and we'll stage questions so we can get the Lieutenant Governor and the Commissioner back up here. Um, uh, unemployment. Uh, we're working day in and day out uh, to rebuild an unemployment office that uh, through uh, years of neglect and then huge cuts in 2017 uh, started uh, this year with 12 individuals uh, that could actually face-to-face -face communicate uh, with the public. With the number of claims that we have seen, uh, there are some things that are very difficult to change. Uh, one is a system uh, that was put into place the year I graduated from college 20 years ago uh, that is outdated and meant to tell people no, but we're working through that. One thing we can change is training the number of people and getting them out in the community that can meet with individuals uh, who, who have claims uh, that need to see someone face to face and help them out. So uh, starting on Monday of next week, Monday through Friday, uh, we will have in-person uh, availability uh, for those with claims uh, in Frankfurt, uh, 8 o'clock to 4.30. It's going to be by appointment. We're going to set up that process uh, through the internet and we will have a separate release out about how people do that. So that will be all week next week with a location in Frankfurt. Next week, June 29th through the 30th, that'll be, I believe, Monday and Tuesday, we're also going to be open an office in Ashland and in Owensboro. They're going to run from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., and I believe that's the local time uh, in, in each uh, to make sure that we can have individuals there uh, that, that don't have to drive to Frankfurt come and see someone in person. Again, we will have additional details uh, about uh, how to sign up uh, for an appointment. July 7th and the 8th, we're gonna be in Somerset and Hopkinsville. And we're gonna have more information on that. My goal is to make sure that we can train enough individuals to where we're not just in a couple places in weeks for a couple of days, but we're able to permanently get out in these communities as fast as, as possible. Uh, but that is our update on the unemployment side on that really critical need uh, for face-to-face -face, and we will have, I hope it is by tomorrow, uh, the ability to sign up. We don't, we don't want people to have to wait in a line again if they're not going to be seen. If we can have people sign up for appointments to come in, not have to wait, be seen, get their claim resolved uh, and go, we can probably all be more efficient and we don't waste uh, anybody's time. Uh, last today, um, earlier today, we had uh, two, two press events, uh, both on an important part of the future of Kentucky's economy. While we spend so much time right now dealing with the present and COVID-19, we have an incredible opportunity to rewrite 
um, Kentucky's economy, about what truly drives us, and to be able to focus on areas that Kentucky can be not just a national, but an international leader. I was focused on Agritech when I ran for office, but since COVID-19 has sent a shock through our food supply in the United States and around the world, it is more critical now than ever that we are a leader in this area. And with the UN estimating that we've got to increase our food supply 70% over the next 30 years to feed our growing world population, we are seeing investment and focus like never before in this area, and it's time for Kentucky to be a leader. So this morning, uh, along with uh, uh, App Harvest and, and many others, uh, we signed an agreement with the Dutch government, uh, with uh, private companies there, with, pri with private companies here, with universities in the Netherlands, with our universities here to create um, a, a public-private partnership to bring the very best knowledge in agritech here to Kentucky. And this is a country that leads the world, and they are committed to helping Kentucky to lead this nation. And who knows, if we do it right, maybe we will have good competition with them as well uh, at some point in the future. I'm sure that's something that we would all want. Uh, this has been, it's an incredible way to launch this agritech initiative. Uh, today we also launched our website listing uh, of the incentives that can take a company from an idea uh, to mass producing uh, and the types of ways that the state can help uh, all throughout. And this is more uh, than just a dream or an initiative. It's something that we see uh, in some anchor companies already in Kentucky that are showing the type of growth and interest, whether it's outside financing or the eyes of the world. You know, one we know well in Kentucky is Alltech. Another uh, that is doing incredible work is App Harvest. Uh, this company, uh, led by Jonathan Webb, I, I can't say enough about him and the company. They are still working to complete their facility, and they're committed to helping us to build this industry. Now, many that are going to be the leader wouldn't try to go out and create space for competitors, uh, but this is uh, a project born of love of, of this state uh, and of, of our people. Now, when App Harvest's uh, first greenhouse is completed, it's going to be the largest greenhouse in North America, and it's located not just in Kentucky, but in eastern Kentucky. It's going to have the ability to supply the entire eastern seaboard uh, with tomatoes. It is the type of opportunity that brings together cutting-edge technology uh, with agriculture, bringing our, our rich tradition into the future, and gives us so many opportunities for so many areas of business. Today has been a really good day for this launch, which I think is going to rewrite our future moving forward. So I wanted to make sure we got Jonathan up here uh, one last time today. Uh, we owe him and his team a lot to helping us get here as quickly as we can. And this is an area where I see the public, our private businesses, and our universities all hungry for something better right here in Kentucky. We're not chasing other places where we are the leader, where we can take our intellectual capital and harness it, create a new workforce, and create the types of jobs where um, my kids, speaking of a school reopening plan, I, I have skin in that game. My, my, my kids. We'll, we'll not look at other states and, and their jobs. We'll have the cutting edge jobs uh, right here in Kentucky. Jonathan Webb. So, uh, thank you, Governor. And, and I know it's hard in this challenging time. I have so many friends and family, you know, worried day in and day out uh, and, and uh, trying to figure out the information of, of what to do in their daily life to, to, to do their best during this time of COVID and your team working so tirelessly. But I think something we need to all keep in mind and in our team and, and why we're doing what we're doing is these once in a lifetime moments are going to be happening every five to 10 years if we don't build more resilient systems. You know, basic human civilization, you know, pillars of human civilization, food, energy, water, health care. And, and we're seeing the cracks in the systems today as it relates to health care, which could have been, you know, much smaller investments, large, but much smaller investments than a you know, $6 trillion investment to, to keep us going had, had the plans been in place to mitigate. Uh, and our team working so uh, focused in the, in the food system, 
uh, that, that again, you know, if, if we do not build more resilient systems of the future, uh, we're, we're going to be uh, in these same situations in the not so so distant future. The uh, governor mentioned the UN Security Council was here in Kentucky uh, right before COVID had started. Uh, there was a report last summer uh, that the world needs 50 to 70 percent more food by 2050 to feed a rising middle class and a growing population. I was at Berkeley last year. They're estimating we would need two planet Earths to have enough land and water to, to grow that food. Uh, so so we're, we're living in this post-COVID world where, you know, as much as I love basketball and sports and, and I love going to a good, good music show, we need to take a step back from time to time and think about all the people that are working so tirelessly, you know, to keep this, to keep this economy and system that we're all a part of going. Uh, our team at App Harvest has set out to build some of the world's largest indoor grow facilities. Uh, and before COVID had started, we we'd already made a commitment to, to be an open uh, team player. We took five universities over to the Netherlands with us to, to visit top universities there uh, today uh, with the governor's leadership. Uh, we, we've had five universities in the Kentucky, uh, University of Kentucky, Morehead State University, Berea College, University of Pikeville, uh, and Eastern Kentucky University all sign up with a collaboration agreement with universities in the Netherlands and seven other private companies to think of how do we rebuild farming. You know, big high level issues that we've had happen here. We were all worried about is food going to be in the, in the grocery store? Well, I can tell you our team, we were pretty concerned about that when this, when this started early. Not just, not just for us, but for our friends and family. Uh, it's a problem. We, we've slowly moved our food production out of this country. Uh, four billion pounds of just tomatoes imported into the U.S. last year. That was 1.2 billion pounds 10 to 15 years ago. We could go on and on and on about some of these th systemic problems as it relates to energy, food, and health, but at some point you got to take action. And, and this administration has done an incredible job uh, through COVID, you know, to keep us safe. Uh, but we all need to start thinking more long-term, big picture. What are those long-term solutions? Uh, and appreciate you, Governor, uh, setting this task force in place during what is already an incredibly challenging time. But you know, the, the world is definitely watching what we're doing here. We, we've had you know, some of the most high-profile investors, uh, researchers, and everybody else coming through Moorhead, Kentucky, to visit what we're doing. So, so we're one we're one player in a bigger picture, uh, and, and we certainly stand for Team Kentucky. We're, we're trying to be as transparent as possible. But you know, coming out of COVID, Governor. Uh, we, we, we're going to be there thinking how, how do we build a, a more resilient economy, a more inclusive economy, uh, and, and look forward to working with you on this as we go forward. Thank you. So a lot of what we're talking about is reopening, but we also need to th think about staying open and then what does our future hold? Um, based on today's announcements, I think it's very bright with significant possibilities uh, to be something uh, even more special in Kentucky. I've always loved this Commonwealth. I've always thought that we do so many things so well that we don't always get credit for. This is an opportunity to be on the cutting edge, to create our own Silicon Valley right here in Kentucky, and it's, a, it's an opportunity that we have uh, to grasp. Uh, last announcement, and then we'll open it up for questions, is this is going to be uh, the last uh, regular uh, press conference COVID update uh, that we're going to have. Um, unless things change, we're going to go to a regular uh, Tuesday at 4 o'clock Team Kentucky update about things going on uh, all over the Commonwealth. In that, we will talk about trends that we've seen in the last week. And we're going to start putting out uh, our numbers on social media through press releases and, and through videos. Uh, I think it's time. Um, we've done a lot of these. I think I've permanently lost uh, part of, of my voice, uh, but I appreciate everybody sticking with us, especially when information was so critical, changing so quickly. We now know a lot more about this virus, uh, and we'll be able to come to you when it's important uh, if, if there are major changes that cause us to change strategy. Um, you know, there, have been, there have been times in these, in these press conferences where um, we've been worried that tens of thousands of Kentuckians would die, and I I can't describe um, how that feels. Um, understanding and empathizing with people's uh, fears and, and anxiety. And now we're in a much different place. 
and we are not out in the woods, and we still need to be vigilant. But uh, we've, we've, we've come through a lot together. Let's make sure we don't backslide. Let's make sure we continue to move forward. And then let's build the type of systems that Jonathan was talking about to where we never have to feel the way that we have felt during this. Again, we never have to worry about if there's food on the shelf. We never have to worry about if there is a hospital bed available uh, for somebody who is sick. This virus is exposed a lot. It's time we start fixing it and not just talking about it. All right, we got a number of journalists, and I know there are a lot of questions on, on education and reopening. If we can, let's start if there are any other questions, and then I will cede the floor uh, to our commissioner and our secretary to, to answer the education questions that aren't directed at me. Uh, we have plans to open uh, unemployment offices across Kentucky, but it's not reopen, it's open. Because in 2017, the in-person unemployment help was pretty much eliminated and all moved into a call center. So one of the challenges that I didn't explain well enough as we went, and, and that's on me, is we don't just have to turn the key and restart something, we have to fully rebuild something. It does tell us, and it's, it's important, it's, it's one of these things that we can't allow to happen again, that if we starve our safety net, uh, that, that people really need when we're in uh, a crisis, and there are lots of different types of crisis, then it's not healthy and when people need it the most. And now it's my job to fix it, and we're going to fix it. I wish I could do it tomorrow. I'm trying, uh, but, but we are going to get it done. We're going to train. Um, my goal is to quadruple our workforce. Uh, that can look somebody in the eye and fix their claims and, and get it done. Uh, and, and our commitment is to do that as fast as humanly possible. Anybody else on non-school? We'll do and then we'll do Mandy and we'll come over here. So uh, the, the question is on masks and, and school reopenings and what's the, what's the preference on masks. A cloth mask will work just fine for what we're looking for. You know, sometimes you like the three-ply. You don't need a surgical mask. This is to protect people around you. And I believe that we're going to see a study from the CDC that says it really protects uh, people around you. Uh, it's coughing, sneezing. Cloth mask uh, will work. Uh, find something that's, that's comfortable. Uh, that works for you. Uh, Stu has glasses, you can't see that, but if, if uh, some of them fog up uh, your glasses, and so he's got a, a different one on, I think, that works uh, for him. Uh, we, wanna, we wanna make sure that people are as comfortable as they can be, and, and there's nothing comfortable about it, uh, but just this can go so far, not just to opening, but to staying open. Uh, and listen, I got, a, I got a son that's gonna start a public middle school when it opens. He's going to be wearing one of these. He wears them when he goes out in public right now, but I'm willing to do that to protect his, his teachers, uh, those around him, and to ensure uh, that, that, that his um, public um, school system is not just going to open, but it's going to stay open. So the Kentucky State Police provided a briefing today, uh, but did not make a recommendation to the legislative branch. They may have used information from that uh, briefing to make their decision. The executive branch will not be closed tomorrow. We will have significantly fewer people. And it's all based on just the size of what's expected. 
the total number of people that are expected at the rally tomorrow, the difficulty in getting in and out of the Capitol. It doesn't have anything to do with the content of it, uh, just the, the number of buses that we're hearing are coming and the logistics of getting around that circle in and out. People are still going to be working. Uh, they've worked remotely before. We just want to make sure that uh, they don't have issues getting in and, and, and out of the Capitol. Chris. Uh, I believe that Kentucky is doing uh, better on unemployment than many other states, though if, if somebody hasn't been helped, it's, it's not enough. Uh, initial claims um, that have been processed, we are uh, higher uh, than just about any other state, being in the 90s. Um, our vendor uh, that has come in um, and, and other potential vendors talking about their experience around the country and where we are uh, versus where uh, other states are, uh, it's hard to know exactly uh, because uh, the numbers uh, require so much context. How many initial claims have been processed? How many people got a first check but haven't gotten a, a second check? There's lots of, of different issues that can pop up. There are some states that have concerns about hundreds of thousands of claims and whether they are fraudulent or they've been held up on their computer system uh, by fraud. If you look around the country, you'll see everybody's dealing with something like this. Uh, how it's being reported or exactly what numbers are out there can vary, but it's hard. It's, it's hard everywhere. Uh, it's based on, I think just about every state at different points had starved uh, their safety net. Uh, we have a, a federal system that is designed to originally tell you no, you know, no to uh, independent contractors, no to uh, daycare workers at churches, no to substitute teachers that suddenly is a yes but the infrastructure isn't there. It needs to be a yes, but the infrastructure uh, isn't there. Uh, our job is to, to, to help everybody, uh, and, and that's, in the end, the only, the only metric we'll judge ourselves by. Karen. Governor, you don't have a right now. Could we continue to get tallied today on how many UI claims are still unresolved? Can you talk about Yes. Uh, and and the, 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 the numbers, um, you know, I, I continually try to get them. Are, they're frustrating. Uh, information in a system that is written in a different language uh, when there are, um, uh, I believe, dozens of reasons that you can be denied uh, under federal law. Uh, what we're finding in a lot of these is uh, people check the wrong box and the system isn't set up to say, you realize if you check this you don't get unemployment and this is what it means. No. It accepts it, it thanks you for it, and then it rejects you. Um, and so there's a, a lot of change uh, that's needed there. Um, and, and our goal is Fix it as quickly as possible, but fix it for the long term, uh, not just for the immediate crisis. How exactly did the state kind of come with this plan of action in regards to the offices that will be open and why can't it be done in the state of Kentucky? Because it's not like Kentucky has been open for people. Our limitations on how many offices can open on unemployment is a limitation on employees that we have that are trained to do the work. Uh, remember, it was down to 12 people that would interface with the public. Uh, when we took over. So you look at wanting to have enough to where you're able not just to, if, if I sent one adjudicator out into an office to open it, how many people would they help in a day? And, and how much would that truly help? So we want to have uh, enough individuals there uh, to be able to make a, a full uh, and real difference. Our goal is to open these offices full time, long term, and to keep them open after this is done. It's just taking the training. Now, one of the reasons we're bringing in outside help, and I believe that's being finalized, is I want to be able to do the training for several hundred new adjudicators as quickly as possible. That could give us, for instance, 10 adjudicators in 20 different locations that we don't have uh, right now. And so it's, 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 if, if there are lessons learned, it's that you've got to have somebody who has the experience to truly resolve a claim when they're looking at somebody. If they're just screened by somebody who can only do a little bit, then they've got to go back home and it increases the frustration. All right. Over the weekend, there was the hashtag All Lives Matter Kentucky, uh, where some celebrities, including LeBron James, Ellen DeGeneres, Joe Pro, just to name a few, were suggesting that there was an active effort to suppress vote in Kentucky. Earl Cunningham came out on Monday and said that he did not believe that that was the case. Some have said this question whether that effort was indeed uh, maybe urging people not to go to the polls. What's your take on what 
Well, I, let me start by saying I don't think anything ultimately hurt turnout. I think we're going to have the highest turnout ever in a primary in Kentucky. And regardless of, of, of different things that happened or things that we can do better, that's something to celebrate. Biggest ever is it's great. That's democracy at a level we haven't uh, seen before. I believe a lot of what we saw on social media was reacting to one piece of information out of context. And that's what happens on social media. You get uh, a certain number of, of words, and it, and it concerns me sometimes that a lot of information is simply accepted from it without that extra uh, depth that uh, a newspaper or a, or a newscast uh, can, can give. Uh, I think what most didn't know, and I made some calls to, to, to different folks to try to spread the word, mainly, mainly regional folks hoping they could spread it further, is that none of the, the tweets that we saw talked about having what, what's the equivalent of mail-in voting for the first time ever. And as we see, that drove a huge turnout, and I hope we can keep it permanently. Uh, no excuse early voting, which helped uh, to reduce lines that would have otherwise been at the polls. That's great, and I hope we can keep it uh, forever. Did we need some more polling locations? Yes, but I got to tell you that they, uh, with the exception of Lexington where they expanded, uh, I think they did their best with the plan uh, that they had. But I hope that, that that social media, I hope that some of the comments on one polling location that we should have more isn't used as an excuse to simply go back to the way it was before and not do the mail-in voting in the future and not do the early voting in the future. And I have fears that it will be used that way. So we've got to stand up for democracy. We've got to stand up for access um, uh, to not just the polls, but the ability to vote. In November, I'm fully for the no excuse absentee ballots. I'm fully for the early voting. We need to expand polling locations and I'm willing to ask the National Guard again to help with that. Now let's turn it over to our education folks because I know that there are questions there too. I said I thought we did such a good job there wouldn't be any questions, but you have any questions? So the question was, uh, what is my advice uh, to teachers who and parents who have students who just refuse to comply with wearing a mask? And I think I would very simply say that wearing a mask is much more comfortable than wearing a respirator. Well, I think uh, Commissioner Brown made a great point uh, a couple days ago in a meeting. He said, you know, our, our kids come to school wearing shoes. They come to school wearing shirts because society expects that that's how we behave. And so the best chance that we have to make sure that this has not become an overwhelming issue is to have role models who set the expectations as adults for student behavior. Yes, sir. I'm curious whether you discussed any of the thoughts on the mask with the KDA and the, the, the state legislature that you've been involved with and how they may respond to this I'm curious Well, you know, the question is how have we, have we spoken with the KEA and, and JCTA on uh, the mask issue, and we have. And uh, they actually are very interested in making sure that our workforce is safe. Um, one of the biggest concerns they have, if we have especially teachers who are older, or maybe there are folks who have health conditions, that we want to make sure that we wear those masks um, and that our students do not just to protect themselves, but to protect our teachers as well. Yes, sir. The governor has said that these requirements, some will be mandatory and some are strong recommendations. Mm -hmm. In broad terms, what's mandatory about this and what are you not recommending? Well, the, the commissioner spoke about the, the expectations versus best practices, and I think that's probably the best um, depiction of what is expected. Do you want to kind of go over that again? I know you talked about it a second ago. You can give an example, maybe. The expectations, and I, let me just read you a paragraph from the document. Uh, 
practices listed in this document are divided into safety expectations that must be implemented by schools as determined by the Kentucky Department of uh, Public Health uh, and supported by the Kentucky Department of Education. Best practices are additional strategies that schools may choose to follow in order to optimize the safety of students and staff. When you see the document, you will uh, it's very clear. There are graphics, there's shading uh, to indicate the things that are at a glance, for example, that are requirements. Uh, and then boxes that show uh, districts uh, also best practices. So for example, um, social distancing is mandatory um, when, in, 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 uh, when moving down a hall. Um, six feet social distancing is required in classrooms unless everyone has a mask on. And then when everyone has a mask on, you can decrease that um, amount between students. So that, those are some examples there. Temperature taking, for example, is an expectation, is required upon entry to the school campus. It's a major uh, way for us to detect and, uh, any uh, symptoms that a student has so they can then be excluded and further tested. The question is whether there's an age for uh, our mask would not be require, required. Initially, the discussion was at age five. However, we have five-year-olds and six-year-olds in kindergarten, and so uh, public health, and we have worked to change that to kindergarten students, the mask will be optional. There, there will be guidelines. I know, for example, the Kentucky Music Educators Association recently proposed, uh, uh, provided a proposal to um, the Department of Public Health, and I think that's being reviewed for band and band operations, band competitions. Uh, the Kentucky High School Athletic Association, of course, they are in uh, almost daily contact, I think, with public health as well as with the governor's office about those, and those that guidance will be coming out uh, based on individual sports, based on time of the year, uh, and the types of practices that can take place and cannot take place based on, if you heard the governor talk about, and Dr. Stack, low contact sports. Um, and then whether or not there's masking requirements will be included in those uh, documents. Uh, and let me add to that too, the other question was about theater, but if you've watched, a lot of these college athletes are returning to campus and we're seeing numbers um, from places like Alabama football and Clemson football. And so I would just tell you this, that shows if you have programs that have that amount of money and access to the best medical professionals that you can buy and they are still having trouble controlling the spread within their own team that's going to make it really hard obviously for high school teams and so these these guidelines that are in place are obviously for safety reasons but you know it, this is something that everyone is dealing with everywhere regardless of how big your team is or how much equipment they have and so that's going to be a real issue moving forward Well, so one of the flexibilities that is allowed is uh, has to do with student attendance. And so if, if I'm a parent and I don't want my student to wear a mask and, and attend school that way, then I can, I can, they can stay at home and the instruction can be delivered digitally if that's what the school district decides to do. Um, I was an assistant principal and so I dealt with discipline quite a bit um, as part of my job and I would tell you that this is something very similar to a dress code. Um, you know, we have dress codes in every school across Kentucky and, and students are expected to abide by those rules. Um, I would leave it up to the school district as to how they choose to um, respond uh, to these challenges because it's going to look different in every, in every corner of Kentucky. Yes, ma'am. Well, and I, I can let the commissioner expand on that, but I will tell you that from our, our uh, standpoint as an administration, we are allowing the flexibility to school districts to resume educational services as they see fit. 
Um, for example, there are some districts I have heard talk about, they are just gonna go ahead and start the school year digitally. They've already made that decision. Um, and we support that because the superintendents have surveyed their community and their parents and their students, and that was the result, and that should be the way that they get to do it. There are some school districts that have talked about doing an A-B schedule, so half of the students come on certain days and the other half come on the other to help with social distancing, um, and then when they're not at school, they participate in digital learning. Absolutely acceptable because it still follows these guidelines. Um, you know, we want to support these districts to be able to make the decisions that are best for them. What it looks like in, a, in the tiny town where I grew up in, in Bergen, Kentucky, is going to look very different than it does in, in your home of, of Jefferson County. And so that's why these waivers were so important, to allow for funding and attendance to um, not be uh, hindrances to the plans moving forward and allow for more innovation. Um, you know, I would look at it this way. A lot of folks are very concerned um, that things are changing. I see this as an opportunity to reimagine learning. And I see this as an opportunity for us to look at things that weren't working in the past and think about how we can make them better moving forward. Uh, and, and again, with the input of educators uh, on our task force um, and, and, and district leaders, we've been able to allow uh, for those flexibilities for that exact reason. Do you want to say something else about that? I think you nailed it. <laughs> sure. Okay, so that might be a Dr. Stack question. Um, it's, the question was about um, why haven't we given a metric for, for schools to follow or, or a, a threshold to close. I would tell you that um, our school districts already make those decisions and not, not to compare COVID-19 to the flu, but um, schools have been known to close for the flu before. Um, there's no metric given by the state. The local district leadership and the local health department come together and they make that decision based on what's best for their community. Do you want to add to that? Thanks, Lieutenant Governor. So we've tried to be very careful about not offering um, false precision where it doesn't exist. And so I think the reality is there's not enough precision for us to predict now what those metrics would be and then reliably expect people to execute to them. So I think it's going to continue to require people to use um, the best science and knowledge available at the time, uh, coupled with professional judgment and, and good faith trying to do the right thing. So I, I don't think it would be actionable to give that level of detail on this kind of plan. Yes, I think the governor and I both hope that we don't have to go there. I hope that we can persuade people through inspiring them that wearing these masks and doing social distancing and other relatively inconvenient but simple measures can help us to minimize having to do that. So I think our hope is to inspire Team Kentucky to rise to the call like they did clearly in the beginning of this initiative. When we started this in March and April, Team Kentucky did what it needed to because we blunted the curve. We, we clearly blunted the curve. So let's all inspire people to do the right thing going forward over the next uh, weeks and months so that hopefully we never have to go back to that kind of shutdown. The question is whether a bus driver has any recourse if a student uh, refuses to to get on the bus without a mask, uh, attempts to get on the bus without a mask on. Uh, that's a, s somewhat complicated because we are not permitted to leave students at bus stops. Uh, so the expectation is that the student have a, has a mask on when they enter the bus. We also know that we're dealing with students and we know that maybe they, they could have lost their mask on between from uh, going from the home to the bus stop. And so uh, best practice here will be that bus drivers and buses will have some extra masks on board, never been used, that can be uh, handed to that child if they enter the bus and don't have one. The expectation for them, though, to get on the bus is that they have one. Um, 
child can't be left at the bus stop, so they would be transported then uh, on into school if they didn't have their mask on, and then that would be dealt with by the building administration as they would deal with any other student issue. So districts will provide some PPEs for It's anticipated that districts, of course, will provide PPE as they do provide other uh, items for students, but we also know that students are probably gonna be, will want to wear masks that, uh, you know, may have their, favorite uh, character on there, favorite team on there, uh, but we do anticipate that districts will be uh, having PPE on hand.